very much, and thanks to Kate and the organizing committee for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's my second trip to Zimbabwe. The north, first was in the north to Victoria Falls, my first interest meeting, hopefully not the last. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's always a pleasure to talk about adherence. I've been talking about it, as uh, you indicated, for probably 20 years or so. I've been working in this field for about 20 years. Uh, we've made some progress, I, I'd like to say, but uh, not as much as we need. And so what I'm going to talk about today is pretty basic stuff. Uh, I'm going to talk about just the definitions of adherence, and then I'm going to talk about how we measure and monitor adherence and why, why we do it. The uh, fact of the matter is that just measuring something doesn't help us very much. We really have to understand what we do with the information uh, that we obtain. So the general definition of non-adherence is on this slide. It's present when the actual treatment a subject receives is different from the nominal or intended assignment. But that's really not a very good definition. It that doesn't have any quantitative information in it. And at the same time, adherence is not a dichotomous variable. You're not either adherent or non-adherent. You're something in between. And so no single metric that is percent of prescribed doses taken, which is the one that I hear most often being discussed, can adequately describe the actual patterns of adherence. And as you'll see as I go through this uh, presentation, that time is a very important component of describing adherence. And we need to have and use a common taxonomy for describing adherence, and I'm going to talk about that in the next uh, couple of slides. It was developed by an, a working group that was put together in the European Union to discuss and de develop this toxa toxa <laughs> taxonomy for adherence. And it's a process, as I mentioned, over time by which patients take their medications as prescribed. There are three components, initiation, implementation, and persistence. Initiation is whether or not the patient uh, initiates their treatment, and it's a binary variable. You either do or you don't initiate your treatment. Implementation really talks about how you actually take the drug once you've started the drug. And you may delay, omit, or take extra doses. And that's the so-called dosing history. And you'll see a number of different dosing histories that I'm going to show you in just a few minutes. And then finally, the third component is called persistence. And persistence is the time to event. That is, when a patient decides, either uh, consciously or unconsciously, we see somebody who's pretty good in terms of the timing, particularly of the afternoon dose, but then has a fairly extensive, what we would call a drug holiday that occurs halfway through that three-month period, and then begins to show some much more erratic behavior in terms of behavior after that uh, time, after that uh, period of missed doses. And then in the lower right-hand panel, what we have is somebody who takes the doses very regularly, both in the morning and in the afternoon, and then stops taking the doses. So if we just look at percent adherence, all of these individuals, as I said, had 75% adherence to the prescribed doses. But I think you can see and kind of imagine that the impact of these different types of adherence or different patterns of adherence might have substantial impacts on the outcome for each of those individuals. Another implementation example is shown here. These are with once daily doses. And again, each of these individuals actually took uh, 90% of their prescribed doses over time. And you can see that uh, in panel A, a very good adhere, but somebody who did not initiate their therapy until several days after the prescription was written. And we know from other studies that actually up to 10% of people never initiate their therapy even after it's been prescribed. In panel B, again, we see somebody that is pretty good about dosing with some variability around the time, but then discontinues early. In panel C, we see somebody that's very good about the timing of their doses throughout most of that 12-month uh, period, but has a drug holiday about a third of the way through. And then in the fourth one, we see somebody that basically misses a few doses here and there so that their adherence becomes 90 percent. But it's a pretty nice pattern of, of dosing. I think most of us in the room who have any daily dosing would recognize that as being pretty optimal level of adherence. So we really need to understand what people are actually doing rather than just using a percent that may not really help us understand or describe what people are doing and, uh, as I'll show you later on, what we then might do to be able to uh, alter that behavior. I want to emphasize that the most important factor in terms of adherence and non-adherence is lack of persistence. And this uh, panel, which is derived from a large number of, of studies uh, that are accumulated using electronic monitoring, 
over a number of, of different diseases, demonstrates that in clinical trials for HIV, 40% of the patients in a clinical trial will have discontinued treatment by 12 months. That's a pretty spectacular loss of, of uh, people who remain on therapy. And you see, for example, that in psychiatric illnesses such as depression, it's even lower. In other diseases, it seems to be higher, but there's nobody, there's no disease in which adherence is really anywhere near what we imagine it might be. And just to illustrate when we're using these numbers and, and thinking about what we need to do, that basically we have the situation, as I showed uh, on the previous slide, where adherence drops off over time, and then the implementation is not 100% during that trial. And so what we're looking at is really two components of adherence. As I said, this uh, uh, discontinuation, early discontinuation, this uh, sometimes not adequate implementation. And when we look at that all together, we see again that the major factor uh, that influences us in terms of influencing the outcome is the persistence that the individual has with their therapy. So again, going back to the summary, we have about 25% of patients who do not initiate a prescription. We have on each day about 15% of the patients who don't take the medicine as prescribed. And then over the course of uh, the uh, therapy, 40% uh, of patients discontinue treatment earlier. And then in the bottom panels indicate some of the factors that influence each of those processes, initiation, implementation, and persistence. The key message that I want to leave you with is that suboptimal adherence is the rule rather than the exception during clinical trials, but also during treatment settings. The most important problem in adherence is lack of persistence. Poor implementation is less problematic, but can be a precursor uh, to discontinuation, and that's uh, one of the things I'll come back to in a little while. And again, percent adherence is insufficient to characterize individual patient adherence behavior. And we do have technology available to provide accurate and detailed and high, high, high fidelity, high resolution drug dosing histories. Now here's the important message in terms of that I'd also like to leave you with. That is, to measure is to know. If you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And similarly, what gets measured, what gets, ma gets managed. So we really have to understand what people are doing and then we can make changes in behavior, make adjustments that are necessary to improve this process. So let me spend a minute or two talking about how we measure adherence and, and emphasize some of the differences in the various methodologies that are used. And this is four different quadrants. And if you look at the lower quadrant and look at retrospective questionnaire data or pill counts, those are actually quite, un, uh, quite biased. And I think anyone who's done pill counts realizes that those pill counts really give us very little information. Patient diaries are often used, but again, those are uh, often biased because we, don't, we can't be sure how the patient is filling those uh, diaries out. In the upper left-hand panel, we see therapeutic drug monitoring, which is quite popular in a lot of the studies that you've heard about. And the problem there, again, is we have only sparse samplings. We really don't know that much about the detailed dosing history of those individuals. And the same is true of pharmacy refill data, which also provides a lot of useful information, but not the sort of detailed information. It's most useful, for example, in understanding when a patient has stopped taking their drugs. But we don't find that out often until quite a time after they've discontinued their drugs. The other right hand, upper right hand panel talks about automatic uh, compilation of dosing histories. There's a number of different technologies that are out there in the field. I'm going to show you data from largely coming from something called a MEMS device that provides detailed dosing history information. And what I want to emphasize as I go forward is how important that having that information in fact can be to talking and discussing patients' adherence with individual patients. So again, why do we measure adherence? We measure it because our, our interest is in interventions to improve adherence. And if you look at the boxed area here, what we've been able to see or been shown by looking at a meta-analysis is that providing feedback to patients about their adherence is actually quite an effective way of changing or improving their adherence. The other way is certainly something that we've heard a lot about during the course of the conference here, and that is cognitive behavioral education also has a significant impact on uh, patients' adherence. And we can use these approaches in essentially simultaneously to actually improve adherence in, in many of our patient populations.
So let me uh, go back to one of these diagrams that I've shown you earlier. This is another example of someone who ultimately has early discontinuation or short persistence. And it's easy to see from looking at this kind of graph, if we had this available to us in a real time or near real time situation, we would be able to see that this person is likely to stop the drug. They start missing a few doses, miss more and more doses, and ultimately stop taking the drug completely. And having this kind of information available to you in a, uh, uh, a not necessarily completely real time, but essentially when you're seeing your patient uh, can provide a lot of information that you can then discuss with the uh, individual patient and perhaps implement, a, a, implement some change. And I'm showing uh, this uh, graph, again, similar uh, format to the earlier ones of an in individual example that had a successful intervention. Again, you see on the left-hand side of the uh, panel here an individual who is missing a lot of doses. Timing of the doses is quite irregular during the course of the day. An intervention takes place where the uh, pattern of, of adherence is discussed with the patient and the reasons for taking the drug are explained. What we see is, is basically someone who goes from that bad pattern on the left to what looks like a very good pattern in the middle of the slide. And then towards the end of the panel, and this goes over a fairly long period of time, it looks like this individual is starting to slip back into a pattern where they may begin to miss doses and ultimately perhaps stop the drug again. So this kind of information and having the ability to actually discuss this information uh, with individual patients is really quite uh, valuable. Uh, I'll stop and take a little tangent for a moment. We were in uh, uh, Senegal about two weeks ago introducing this electronic monitoring uh, system to a prep study, a demonstration project that's about to get underway there. And a lot of the folks there were actually the people who are on the front lines seeing the patients. And they were actually very excited about the ability when a patient comes back in and, and those data are available in front of them to be able to talk to the patient and understand why are you having this kind of problem? Why are you missing, missing the doses here? Or conversely, you're doing a great job, pat on the back, great work, keep going. And so having this information really enhances that dialogue that you can actually have with your patient or the provider can have with his or her patient to really talk with them about what's happening. It's, it's very surprising in some ways that a lot of people really don't understand until they see the data right in front of them on that kind of graph that I've just shown you, how often they are missing doses or how often they're having trouble uh, remembering to take their drug or what are the factors that are influencing that, uh, uh, that uh, behavior. I, showing this uh, slide, uh, just based on the talk that we heard yesterday about HIV viral load measurements, this is some work that comes out of Uganda with uh, David Bangsberg and, and his colleagues. And what they've done is do some machine learning to uh, be able to predict, based on uh, the individual adherence patterns, uh, when uh, it may be valuable or when it would be useful to do RNA, HIV, RNA viral, viral load monitoring. And the idea here is if you look at this paper just out last week, what they believe they can show is that one can actually reduce unnecessary viral load determinations and increase the number of viral loads that are needed to make decisions about uh, p potential changes in therapy. Uh, so I think this is a very exciting and, and recent paper that really illustrates that you can do more than just counsel patients with this kind of information. I'm going to finish up by talking about this whole question of how much adherence is enough because, again, nobody's perfect. And so we really have to understand what level of adherence is actually sufficient. And unfortunately, there's not a simple question in HIV or, for that matter, in uh, any uh, disease, chronic disease state. It certainly depends on the patient's patterns of missed doses. That's what I was trying to illustrate earlier. But it also is very dependent on the drugs that are being used for therapy. It depends, for example, on the dose of the drug, the half-lives of the various drugs, if it's a multi-drug uh, combination, as most of the HIV uh, drugs are, their duration of action, which may differ from uh, individual components of the, com of the uh, regimen, and then the forgiveness of the individual drugs. So there's no simple answer is really what I'm trying to say. And, and uh, what we need to do is really understand better uh, which patterns of adherence 
are going to be forgiving and which patterns of adherence may not be particularly forgiving in terms of the risk of, of developing uh, drug resistance. So again, uh, just to look at uh, this whole idea of, of, of patterns, this uh, red line shows if we were perfect dosing, this was what we would see in terms of the pharmacokinetic profile and the exposure of the drug. However, this data, these data come from patients uh, being monitored by uh, this uh, uh, electronic monitoring. This is for an individual patient, and what you see on the blue line is basically the exposure of those individuals or that individual to various concentrations of the drug over time. And again, the blue dots at the bottom part of that panel represent the individual dosing times. The red dots would have been perfect dosing. But what you really see here is that uh, there will be times when patients are overdosing because they may have missed a dose and decided to take an extra dose. They may reach in a range where they would have some toxicity. And then at other times when they're missing doses, particularly if they're missing several doses over a relatively short period of time, their blood concentrations, their serum concentrations may fall below a level that's really necessary to prevent additional viral replication. And in those circumstances, they're, they're at risk of either failure, virologic failure, or the development of resistance. So one of the things that actually electronic monitoring allows us to do is project the time course of the drug concentrations over whatever time period you collect the data and use that into actually understanding the pharmacokinetics and exposure of individual patients. So I'm going to show you several examples of uh, how this has actually been used to project uh, drug exposure concentrations. Now, in the red lines on these slides, the, this is the projection assuming that perfect intake and that the patient is at steady state. The green lines, which I hope you can see, I can't see them very well from here, is the projection based on a combination of electronic monitoring. And then they, what's done in this case is to measure a single drug concentration and then use that drug concentration and the adherence data to essentially create a, uh, a drug exposure. And, and you begin, when you see these kinds of graphs, and I'll show you some additional ones, you begin to understand where the problems become in terms of the uh, pharmacokinetics of the drug and the, and the lack of exposure. And again, on each of these uh, six panels, the red line is perfect adherence, the green line is uh, the actual adherence, and uh, the projection of the concentration based on each of these cases uh, shown by the uh, red dot a single measure of the drug concentration in those individuals. And if you look at this kind of pattern, you can really begin to understand what kind of patterns of adherence might in fact be likely to lead to either failure or to a resistant uh, virus. And uh, so you get a tremendous amount of information when you are able to combine a measured drug concentration with uh, information about that individual's specific dosing history. So again, uh, the forgiveness depends on the drug being used, the dose, the half-lives, the duration of action, the forgiveness. And I want to just uh, spend just a moment talking about this concept of forgiveness. Basically, forgiveness is defined as how long a drug action continues at therapeutically effective concentrations or levels after a last taken dose. <clears throat> or the, another definition would be the post-dose duration of action of effective action minus the recommended dosing intervals. So when we give a drug every 12 hours, <clears throat> presumably one of the reasons we do that is we think that if we give it less often that the pharmacokinetics of the drug and the duration of action of the drug will not uh, uh, provide acceptable coverage. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if we know that a drug is only effective at plasma concentration that we're able to measure, we can actually begin to understand the value of different dosing regimens. And we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, using uh, some information that was generated on using HIV protease inhibitors. So uh, this was a very interesting study. There, it's been replicated in clinical uh, trials a couple of times that show that Therapeutic superiority is sometimes obtained when you're giving a drug twice a day rather than just once a day at the same total daily dose, and I'll show you why in just a second. So basically what this shows uh, is that if we look at uh, the once daily dose, which is represented by the red line here, and the uh, twice daily dose, which is represented by the uh, 
by the blue uh, line here. And again, the average concentration for both of those regimens is the same. But the difference is actually interesting because if you miss one single daily dose and you're not on a BID regimen, then you will fall below some somewhat arbitrary minimum effective concentration before you take the next daily dose. If you're on a twice daily regimen, again, the same total daily dose, you won't fall below that concentration unless you miss three consecutive doses. That's unusual. It's not that unusual, and I'll show you in the next slide, for people to miss uh, one dose. That happens 73% of the time. But missing three consecutive doses and having your concentrations fall below the limit of uh, effective dose or the minimum effective concentration happens only 54% of the time in the BID regimens. And these are all data. These, these come from real studies, real people, real data. So it's not, this is not simulated. This is actual data. But the concept that actually BID dosing is sometimes easier for patients and less likely to fail because of the forgiveness, if I can use that term here, of taking the drug often enough that you don't fall below that minimum effective concentration. So what can we do to improve adherence? That's, that's again, the key question of why we measure it. We want to be able to do something about it. And I don't have a simple answer. Uh, and this slide and, and these, these slide sets will be available to anyone that's interested after the meeting. It, there's nothing proprietary here. But I'm just trying to uh, illustrate with this that there's so many different components that have an impact on uh, whether or not a patient is actually uh, able to take their drug as prescribed. It has to do with the healthcare providers, the healthcare professionals, we've heard about that. It has to do with the patient himself or herself. It has to do with the whole health system. Uh, we were just talking during the break about, and I think you saw that in some of the earlier presentations, about the frequency with which there are stockouts where it's essentially a patient stops taking the drug because it's not available to them. So we really have to look at a very holistic picture of how we can improve adherence. And I do think that based on the uh, uh, work that we've been doing, uh, particularly with the feedback to individual patients, that that's actually a very powerful way of actually changing uh, someone's uh, drug-taking behavior and in, uh, in hopefully in the long run being able to continue having that individual on the drug for a long time because, again, the biggest problem is if you can detect when somebody is starting to lose their enthusiasm about taking their medicines and it's likely to stop, if you can counsel them at that point in time, you may have a lot more success and a lot, uh, a lot less need for uh, 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 taking on second-line therapy. So I'll stop there and happy to 